Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. At the start of a legislative session when as many as 700 bills could come up for consideration, no one has a bigger job than the two leaders of Wyoming's legislative chambers. We'll meet the Wyoming Senate President Ogden Driscoll and the Speaker of the House Albert Summers. I'm Steve Peck of Wyoming PBS. Join us for Capital Outlook. This program is supported in part by a grant from the BNSF Railway Foundation, dedicated to improving the general welfare and quality of life in communities throughout the BNSF Railway Service Area. Proud to support Wyoming PBS. And by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you for your support. Hi, I'm Steve Peck of Wyoming PBS. Welcome to Capital Outlook, our first uh, legislative edition of the new Capital Outlook season. We're here at the Wyoming Capitol in Cheyenne and joined today by the President of the Senate, the Speaker of the House in Wyoming, Senator Ogden Driscoll, Representative Albert Summers. Welcome to you both. Thanks for being with us to help us kick off this uh, new season of Capital Outlook. The session just now getting started. Uh, Senator Driscoll, what's your sense of how things are going so far, if you can sense that yet? So we're just hitting the ground running. You know, we've come off a, a pretty contentious uh, running season for people and lots of new people. And uh, so the pomp and circumstance kind of was yesterday and today. And then we get down to business. And I look forward to really a good session. The people are uh, f falling in together and everybody's kind of eager to to get down in the trenches and get to work for the state. Sure, that's just the way you want it to be here at the beginning. Speaker Summers, what, uh, you echo those sentiments, what's your sense of things so far? So Steve, you know, kind of the same. You know, the House has 29 new members out of 62. And uh, so I think actually the pomp and circumstance is a wonderful opportunity for those, those really true freshmen to see and to feel where they're at, right? They're in the capital, really, the, uh, the essence of where our government takes place. And, and I think you could see yesterday in the faces of many of those young legislators that awe, as we should be, in awe of, of being in this position. That's an interesting point. I spoke uh, when uh, State Superintendent Schrader had just been appointed and within a few days had to come to work, and he told me, uh, on, on air, he said, I walked in the building and thought, boy, I work here now. And it was, uh, it was meaningful to him. You say there are 29 new members in the House. Is that, uh, I mean, the Senate has longer terms, but a lot of new faces there too, I presume. Well, we have uh, three raw freshmen that are brand new coming in, and then we've got uh, really gifted. We've got the past Speaker of the House, Eric Barlow, has moved over and come in, and he's obviously a, a good leader. And understands the process well, and Dan Larson from Powell is also over, and he's a seasoned legislator out of the House. So, you know, we've only got three of the new ones, and uh, all three of them got their heads screwed on their shoulders solidly, and uh, I think we're really going to have a good session. What exactly is the Speaker of the House, for example, compared to uh, what we might call a regular legislator? So the Speaker of the House is basically the chief administrator of the House, right? We kind of direct traffic and we run the session. You know, we run the, the, the day session. We assign committee members to committees. We, uh, we introduce bills. It's kind of very similar between the, between the two presiding officers. But a lot of it is administerial. And then sometimes you have to be a, you know, a middle school principal. And so... It's kind of a combination of jobs, but, but ultimately we're, we're administrators more than policy makers at this point. And I assume when, when you say nearly half of your house is having their first session here this week, and two years ago there were a lot of new faces then too, so there's, some might just be in their second session. They've had the interim period, had some committee work. Well, I imagine that could make the job of the administrator, as you call the speaker, um, maybe a bit more challenging. Certainly. You know, of course, I have never had the job of speaker, but I've been a majority floor leader. And I think the more new members you have, it's, it's a coaching thing as well, right? 
we're here to to educate new members so they can become um, efficient and quality legislators. It's incumbent upon us older legislators to mentor new legislators and teach them like we were taught, right? How to respect the process, how to be civil, um, how to what decorum means, and the fact that we are part of an institution that really is the the crucible of democracy. Senator Driscoll, when you're talking to a new member, uh, what are some of the things that, that you tell them? I know just the, some of it's the logistics of where do I park and what door do I come in and where do I sit? And it's a lot of it is at, at that basic level and then you build from there. Yeah, you know, when you run, and I remember back I, uh, a little over a decade when I went in and you come down, you, you've run a race and you know you're here to set policy for Wyoming but almost no one understands how the process really works till you get here. And it's such a combination of things. I was just visiting this morning about it with, with one of our pages. And uh, it really is a mix of intelligence and personality and being able to work with other people. And when you come down, you know, you, you have a feeling that it's about you. And when you really get into it, you find out it's about us. And that's a, a, a tough deal to get to once in a while because the race really is focused on you. And so you've gone from a contentious race that you're out running usually against something. And all of a sudden now you're not against something. You're trying to do for something. And that's building policy for Wyoming. And to get the grasp that it's not a bill, it's not something for you, but you're really setting policy for all your constituents and the rest of the state. And, once you get that grasp, then it goes to a different level. And you're truly working as part of a team, not trying to go against. And of course, everyone in Wyoming knows the splits we've got. And that's the real challenge for the speaker and I is uh, very similar to what's in DC. You've got here and here, and how do you bring them together so that they find the common good that we all craft really good policy for Wyoming? Because it's not one side against the other. It's about how do we together craft really good, solid policy for the state going forward. And of course, we're in a critical time. We've got a budget surplus this year. It's uh, uh, not going to last. We know that. So we've got a unique situation that we can invest, but not have the income coming in full time. So how do you make those wise investments? And for them, they're, they're really in an interesting place. And it's going to be a, a great session, I think. It's going to be a, a test, but it's going to be a good one. We're here in early January. The election was in early November. There's a period of a couple of months there where new members get some formal sort of orientation, don't they? Do, do either of you play a role in, in that? Yeah, we, have, uh, we had three new member trainings. Uh, we had one in November, and then we had two new member trainings um, just this, just earlier. So like, when they get uh, elected, they're within a few days, the work begins for them. It, it really did this year. We tried to get a new member training early and like right off the bat in November to give them a little bit of, of history. And, and then this last new member training, we tried to actually get them to the mic, run through the process of a session and how a bill works and, and how you would mend a bill on the floor and, and the motions you would make and, and just try to teach them. Ultimately, they've got to watch and learn and listen, right? Like, like we all do, it's, you know, it's funny, we all come in with these type A personalities and probably think we're the smartest person that ever hit the, hit the deck running, you know, and, and then you find out, no, you're not. And you, you figure out, ultimately, if you're a good legislator, you figure out who to lean on, who's smarter than you on some issues, and, uh, and then how to manage and, and how to pass legislation you want. Well, these things are important. Senator Driscoll, how many bills on a typical general session, and the odd number of years are the long sessions, we're talking about hundreds of bills that it would least be considered. So I believe the bill drafts, and uh, I'm guessing here, but I think around 700 probably 700. Will, will likely have 500, plus or minus 500 bills will actually hit between the House and the Senate. And so these processes and procedures, this education is extremely important just to help you get work done. It, it is, and it's really hard. As a freshman, uh, you know, one of the things that hit me was you come in and you've got your four or five key areas that you really believe in, and you're, you're pumped up and you're ready to go for it. And then you hit the realization there's another 200 bills in the drawer, 
that you really don't know anything and about. Each one they, of those has someone who feels just as strongly about it, I presume. And absolutely, you and you know, you've got to deal with issues that, frankly, either you don't know about, or maybe in certain cases you don't care about. And you know, you have to as a legislator. You're making judgment on every bill. They're all personal. Everybody has an investment uh, mentally and personally in it. So. That's part of it, is how, how you treat those other legislators on their bills affects how they treat other people. So the system is really based uh, around collegiality and working together. And the people that figure out how to do that almost immediately become your leaders. Yeah, excellent point. I, my, you might may know that my father was a legislator, served in the Senate in the late 90s and into the 2000s. He got appointed to his position. It came down the next morning and sat right there in the front row. And I, was, I came, to, came with him to observe that. And I remember they put him through a uh, sort of a mock session of administrative rigmarole to just to rattle him sort of, just it's almost a joke, amendments and motions and counter motions and Senator Peck, do you concur? And he was sort of, and this is a guy who was 67 years old at the time and had done a lot. But it was overwhelming to him, and they were trying to make it seem a little even harder than it was. But it sort of put him at ease, too. And I just, I'm sure I hear what you're saying, that if you can find a way so that when the session begins, there's less of this, the, the, the headlights aren't right in your eyes anymore. And that's, as senior leaders, a big part of what you have to do. You know, when I, when I came in, we had five days of training. And then during COVID, it cut back to a day or something on Zoom, you know, or I, I can't remember. And, and, uh, and so now we've got back to three. And I think the more you put uh, new legislators in those positions early, you, you know, when you're not in session, I think the more successful they will be. And so I th it, training is important, but ultimately doing is the most important. And the breadth of, uh, of, the breadth of topics we discuss, to me, that's what is so fascinating. I love to learn about a broad set of topics. And uh, I, think, I think a lot of people eat that up, right? The ability to learn about uh, things you've never thought you'd need to know. You become experts in things that you had rarely crossed your mind prior to being a legislator, I'm sure. Absolutely. Does being in a leadership position prevent you from necessarily from doing other legislative tasks? Do you both serve on committees, for example, or are you allowed to do that as leaders? We would be allowed, but we do not. You just do not have the time to do it. Uh, and it does change. Uh, Speaker Summers alluded to it earlier. Is, uh, I've been a prolific legislator as far as sponsor lots of bills, do lots of bills. And all of a sudden, your role changes from being a, a real policymaker to really mentoring and helping your people be more effective. And that's I tell my entire body is, my real job is to make them look good. How, how I can make them do better reflects on how I'm looked at as leader and how the legislators looked at as a whole. And so uh, it really is incumbent on us to, to do that. And Albert and I are, Mr. Speaker and I are obviously very good friends. And that's the other part that is yeah, making does. the two bodies yeah. work together because you know, I, I try to emphasize it's not the Senate versus the House and it's not the legislature versus the executive branch. It's how do we build bridges so all three of us create really good, effective policy for the people. Because when we walk out of here, what we've done during the session affects every one of our constituents. If it's a, anywhere from a seatbelt law to a tax law to whatever it is, there's a direct effect to what we do. And that's, it's really hard to figure that out. The first year I went in, it's like, I'm, I'm gonna teach these guys something. I ran against a bunch of old guys who'd been in a long time. And, you walk in the Capitol and it's like, oh my God, I can actually wreck the car now. Thank God some old guys are here to make sure that I don't really, really get out of, out of whack. Now, nothing prevents you from sponsoring bills. And I know, Speaker Summers, you have a bill or two that under your name heading into the session, correct? Correct. We're still individual legislators that have the ability to bring bills and, and do things. And, uh, you know, I'm going to number a, a whole series of bills, whether I run them and how far they go, that that depends. But no, certainly we still have the obligation um, to represent our district um, as well as, frankly, to represent the state of Wyoming now and to represent our different bodies. Right. We are the representatives of the House and the Senate. 
Wyoming obviously has this huge Republican majority and has for a long time. And so I think from the outside, some people might say, well, then it's just everything's just a rubber stamp and it's a steamroller. But as you mentioned earlier, there's always a place to find division even in a group that seems of like mind, isn't there? And this is what uh, you're dealing with all the time. Sometimes it's just one person who disagrees with another on a bill and you have actual, as, as the word factions, I don't mean it necessarily in a negative way, but there are, there are real differences that are almost the same as another political party. Yeah, and they're, they're for real. On the uh, speaker side, actually, they've got the Freedom Caucus. You know, we can openly talk about it. They've got a group that's within the group that has set their own policies and their, their own way forward. And uh, we're s the same in the House as you're all levels of where you fall. And we're, we're all Republicans. But one of the great thing about the Republican Party here, I really believe it's a big tent party. And they, there's room for basically all of the opinions within it. And, you know, our, our job as leaders is to make a cohesive group out of those. And for my end, you know, we talked about it yesterday when I was installed is it's about how you argue policy, not personalities. And so we can sit and talk, really have a sharp conversation. And Albert and I have some different issues we're that way on. And when we walk out of it, we still don't agree very often but we both respect each other for our opinions. And as Albert said, you get educated. You find just a little piece that you thought you really flushed it out, and you find out that you, you really can make it better. And that's what the legislature does, the sharp debates. And I've said often this year, with the division, I think we'll come with better legislation, assuming we can stay really civil. That's when you craft the best legislation, because you, you really do say, Steve, you, you really need to look at this from the standpoint of this group of people. And as you do that, if you're a good legislator, you'll be moved somewhat to, to do the right thing. Yeah, somebody has this opinion for a reason. Right. Yeah, no, and, and uh, you know, in, in, in Washington, D.C., in Congress, at least when you look from the outside, they've, they've had these the divisions, whether it's division, you know, internally in the Republican Party at the national level or the division between the, the Democrats and the Republicans, and they can't seem to find solutions, right? And so when they come out with a bill in Congress, it's pretty well fully baked. The votes are known. You know, the, we're going to either allow you to bring your amendment or not, and we're going to tell you that it's not going to pass right up front. And then people go on in the, in the middle of the night on C-SPAN and, and give a speech that's meaningless, you know, in, in the Wyoming legislature and what we have to continue to protect, and we have to protect the voice of our individual legislators, is we bring these ideas out in the open. We amend bills, we have conversations, we have debate, and ultimately we do those things that is the basis of a democracy, the basis of a representative government. And, uh, and that's the best policy. When you throw something out there and you debate it, you amend it, you make it better. You compromise. You know, that's a, sometimes a foreign word to people, but compromise is, is what life is about. I mean, has, I wonder if uh, you've seen probably thousands of bills now. How many times has a bill ever passed when there wasn't a compromise from the beginning to the end? Is it, does that ever happen? I mean, it's just... It's it does, but occasion. very rarely, and it's usually an alignment bill of some kind that's just fixing things. Yeah. A revisor's bill, a lot of times you won't have it. But, you know, I, I campaigned in the, a lot of no-compromise people out there, and I said, do you understand an amendment is a compromise? So... When I bring my better mousetrap and Speaker Summers says, I can make your better mousetrap better. So when he amends that bill to change it, what that essentially is, is a compromise. It's if, if my bill's to go forward, it's going to have his idea in it and I'm going to have to adopt it or I lose my entire bill. And so we really are. I, I, I hate the word compromise because that is what we do. Uh, we actually... Uh, you compromise. You work with each other. They have ideas. And Speaker Summers said it perfectly as, uh, you know, we actually do it in the open and do it on the floor. And I can tell you for the people listening, we get emails and texts after a bill is read in. And very many of these amendments come directly out of our constituents that are uh, up on the issues enough. Affected. That, yeah, affected. And they get a hold of us and say, look, th this is bad for us or... You know, if you really look after this way, I look at DD waivers, this, you know, you're going to really hurt this group if you do it this way. 
And so we're affected immediately by our constituents. For anyone that's out there that's listening, uh, there's a few legislators maybe don't get back to them. Nearly all of us, if it's done in a civil manner, we listen to what they say. And I can tell you it has a direct effect on me and other yeah. legislators on how we vote and what we do. Absolutely. Well, it's one of the characteristics of, of the Wyoming legislature and Wyoming in general. I mean, you know a lot of constituents personally. And those that you don't, you're willing to get to know them. And they, can, they have access to you, whether it's at the grocery store or in the halls of the Capitol. They'll, they find you. They talk to you. And... They're important. You know, the other thing that's interesting about the Wyoming legislature is because we're a small state. It, our desks are on the floor. You go to other, other capitals around the nation, they have their own individual offices and they pop in to vote and they pop out. We're on the floor. We're working in the early morning. We're working after the session right there on the floor. We talk to each other. If you can't talk to each other, you can't solve problems. Yeah, I'll, I'll flesh a tiny bit on that because it's something and it's educational for everyone out there. So Wyoming's truly a citizen legislature and all of those people, that's the only office they have and they have no staff. So for those of you out there, it's really hard that you think they're not getting back to you during session is we really LSO helps us draft bills, but all of the personal communications are all done individually and those need to happen either in the morning on breaks or after the session and people get frustrated once in a while but th there is no one there there isn't staff to almost every other state even if they're a citizen legislature they're assigned a person or two people or three and most of them have offices and the only offices we have are leadership offices there's a handful on each side and i can tell you mine's almost a coffee shop because we give it to our committee chairman who don't have offices and other people to be able to do it. So it, it truly is probably out of all 50 states, it is truly the closest to the people of any legislator in the, legislature in the nation. So it's possible that floor debate, which when we watch C-SPAN and see the U.S. Senate or the U.S. House, as you mentioned, these, these, it seems almost ceremonial, these speeches that are made, and if the camera pans around, which it did in recent days with this uh, speaker uh, hubbub, but usually doesn't, the House the chamber's largely empty when many of those speeches are being given. But here you're saying that a floor debate could actually have an effect on a bill. It's not all cut and dried when you come to the floor. I will tell you, it oh, almost absolutely. always does. Yeah. <laughs> almost always. Yeah, you don't, you don't know what you don't know till you know it, right? Legislators can be persuaded <laughs> by other legislators on the floor during the session. It can happen. I have, happen. Yeah, I have changed my mind from Committee of the Whole, which is the first time you hear it, through second reading, through third reading, and, and every amendment, you know, has its own flavor and does something to a bill, and no, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a baked thing. You know, obviously, when you craft your own bill, you think you've got it, right? I've got this. But then you, you just like uh, Senator Driscoll said, uh, you don't have it. Somebody else is going to have an idea to put in there, and you've got to be able to allow that to happen as long as it doesn't ruin the entire intent of your bill. If it does, then you have to find a way to kill your own bill. And there's been people that had to do that. We're here today uh, in the morning and later in a couple of hours, the governor gives his state of the state address. Am I right in suspecting or observing that in Wyoming, the relationship between the governor and the legislature seems closer than in some other states that um, he's, the governor talks about legislation, makes proposals, works with legislative leaders uh, more directly than some people might realize. How, how do you view the, for example, the governor's state of the state or his supplemental budget issues? You take them seriously because you need to. So I'll tell you, the, the governor, and it's happened for quite a while now, we work so closely with him. And, you know, his supplemental budget, as you look at it, uh, it's mainly tweaks. It's not major changes and it's not battles about it. And we're small enough state, we're friends. Uh, I'm sure Mr. Speaker, same as I am, we see the governor almost daily. Uh, we're cordial, we're friends. The branches work together for the better of the state. And to me, it's really how you craft things. You know, when it's adversarial, then games get played on how you get things done. And when you can really sit down on an honest basis and do it you work closely and 
Uh, I think the, the comfort level shows on it. So his new chief of staff is the past well, president of the Wyoming Senate. And uh, for him to do that says, I've got to trust that these people actually are out there to do the right thing. And I, I dedicate my life that way is uh, to really look, it's all three of us working together for the betterment of the, our constituents, not what can I win. I, I can tell you when we go to a conference committee, it's not going to be in my mind is, are we going to whip the house on this? So we come out and I can say, we scored and we won the game. What I want to come out is walk out with Albert and say, the people of Wyoming came out a winner. We, we figured out how to do this together without being contentious about it. We just have a couple of minutes left uh, this morning on Capital Outlook. Are there issues for either of you that loom large as the session begins that, that cropped up and took up a lot of space during the interim or during the committee work that you feel are particularly important to you personally or to your chamber? I, you know, I think the big one for the whole legislature, right, is this revenue surplus. You know, and obviously how we handle that surplus, much of it one time, you know, obviously we're, I say obviously, but we'll save money, right? We'll save a good portion of it. And I think that the discussion will be, you know, should it be in permanent accounts, should it be in temporary accounts, should it be in endowments that do things for people right now? I think those are the internal debates. And then I think statewide, as you saw this influx of, of people during the COVID move, right? All this influx into Wyoming. And we saw that our uh, property tax, residential property tax popped up. I think that'll be a big issue. You'll see, uh, obviously I've got bills on it along with every other, every other member. <laughs> so I think those are two big issues. Yeah, and I, you know, they boil right to the core of the issue and it's really difficult as everyone gets property tax, it hits you right now. But it ties directly back into our school funding and you know, school funding's probably been the key issue of stability in our budgets. When you, we go to every budget, For a long time. we can talk about what we're spending on this fund and what we're doing here, but the real truth of it is the, the monster in the room is how do we long-term fund education funding and minerals have paid all of our bills almost forever in Wyoming and the minerals are ratcheting down and anybody that looked the, the coal revenues all of them are dropping and how do we find a replacement source for that without taxing people and the interesting part is is 70 percent of the property tax that gets paid goes to the schools so as we reform property taxes you have to keep in mind we're taking a dollar away from the school. Every time we give a dollar back to you or to me, we've taken one away from the schools or 70% of one. So that's the balancing act we got is how do we, how do we effectively do it? Because the Constitution set property tax as a key funding source for education, a really a difficult issue. And they, we tend to keep merging into this. You, you say, well, we're going to do property tax. Well, it, it bulges over here. Can't do yeah. one without the other. Nope. Big day for both of you. Appreciate your time here early in the morning. I'll say on camera, we have a standing invitation for you to be here with us every week. If you'd like to be, we expand to a 60 minute format starting next week. So we'll have other legislators and people involved in state government, but I appreciate your time. And I know your uh, insight's gonna be very valuable to us and to our viewers throughout the session. Senator Driscoll, Representative Summers, thanks for being with us this morning on Capital Outlook. Congratulations Thank you, on your new job. Thank you. Thank you. This program is supported in part by a grant from the BNSF Railway Foundation, dedicated to improving the general welfare and quality of life in communities throughout the BNSF Railway Service Area. Proud to support Wyoming PBS. And by the members of Wyoming PBS. Thank you for your support.